Hello folks, my name is Maciej Piotrowski and I will share with you about speeding up the build process of a monolithic application. Currently, I work for Allegro, which is the most popular product search engine in Poland. It also happens to be one of top 10 most visited e-commerce sites worldwide. We have 20 million customers each month and a huge amount of traffic comes from mobile applications, iOS app included. Our application is eight years old. The whole project kickstarted in 2012, and we have a mixed code base of Swift and Objective-C. And in October 2019, we experienced the biggest compilation time issue. When we switched from Xcode 10 to Xcode 11, 370,804 lines of code compiled on our workstations for more than 10 minutes. And these were quite powerful machines. They were equipped with 2.2 GHz six core CPUs and 32 gigs of RAM. We also measured the compilation time on our continuous integration servers. They're more powerful, 3.2 GHz of CPU power, uh, but they, the, still the time was more than five minutes on our CI servers. So it was a huge issue for us. We started measurements of lines of code increment and compilation times in June 2019. And the graph here depicts the increment, 19 month increment of uh, source code. We started with 329,692 lines of code summed up Swift and Objective-C. And in December 2020, we reached 676, 303 lines of code. And we also were measuring the compilation time and we noticed this rule. It's kind of obvious. When lines of code grow, the compilation time grows as well. And it was the same for our project. We were measuring clean builds and clean build is the time it takes for Xcode to compile your project, your workspace from scratch. And in 20 month window, we noticed increment of compilation times as well. We started around 177 seconds, which is uh, more than uh, two minutes, almost three minutes. And in October 2019, we, when we switched from Xcode 10 to Xcode 11, as I said before, uh, we noticed this compilation time of 307 seconds, which is a bit more than five minutes. When we are working uh, on the issue, we are able to uh, establish more or less the uh, normal pattern for our compilation times. And the time uh, fluctuated between 220 seconds to 250 seconds. In May 2020, we noticed a drop due to the work that we did to our workspace and projects. And the drop was quite awesome because in May 2020, we were able to achieve 130 seconds for the compilation. And it's two minutes, 10 seconds, which is great. Usually when you work on a project, on an application over years, the application source code grows because you add more features to the application. And when application grows too much, you, there is usually a tendency to divide the application uh, features into frameworks so that the uh, main application target shrinks and new features get added to frameworks. And in, the, in an organization, there might be this idea of splitting development of every framework to a separate repository. 
And it also happened uh, in the past in our organization. But there were issues when integrating the dependencies back to the main binary. So uh, we got back to a single mono repository. And it all had happened before uh, we started working on compilation time improvement. And this is also the path that your organization may uh, follow in the future if it hadn't done already. So as I mentioned, we achieved 88 seconds compilation time. But how did we compile 78 modules in such a short time? So uh, to achieve fast compile times, you can tap in, into alternative build systems that are able to build a framework and cache its binary. And when needed, at the build time, they would uh, supply version of a framework from cache instead of rebuilding everything from scratch. And there are a few such build tools available on the market, such as Bazel, coming from Google, Buck, coming from Facebook, or Twist, coming from Develop Independently. So Bazel is supported by Google, and it has been adopted by Pinterest, Lyft, and LinkedIn uh, while developing their iOS applications. So it became sort of a standard in the industry for mobile iOS projects. It enables local and remote caching, and it also supports adding custom rules. And by rule, I mean a description on how to build source files into an output. So we wanted to integrate Bazel in our workspace. And it wasn't super easy because we couldn't just plug it in. And it's because Bazel uses build project files instead of Xcode project files. It also uses build command instead of Xcode build. It demands single language code base. If you want to tap into existing Bazel rules that are, that are available open source. And it demands a unified project structure uh, of sub projects in the workspace. But our code base was a mixed code base. Swift and Objective-C. And actually we had undefined structure of sub-projects. Oh yeah, and one more thing. Our manager asked us to provide a seamless developer experience for our developers so that they could still use Xcode for the daily development and the basal layer should be transparent for them. So the first step that we took to introduce Bazel into our workspace was unification of project structure. So every project uh, should follow the same rules, the directory patterns. So in the end, after this uh, work done, we had uh, the, that every target in our workspace had their own directory in the directory, we would have a build project that would contain description for Bazel or on how to build uh, the project. It would also contain a configuration directory with exe config files that would have settings for the project. Uh, we would also have a separate subfolder within the module uh, for each target for the project. So if we had a cart module, it would have cart subdirectory for uh, the framework files, and for example, cart tests subdirectory for the uh, cart tests unit test bundle that gets built. And as I mentioned earlier, we extracted settings from the Xcode project to separate XE config files per configuration, such as debug and release. And these files would contain 
only settings that were specific to this particular project. And the settings could be, for example, Swift version or other Swift flags, compiler flags that enabled certain features within a module. Oh yeah, and I guess you are familiar with reviewing Xcode project file changes. And I can bet that you might not like it. I didn't like it either, because there's nothing fun in uh, navigating through diff changes in Xcode project files. And guess what? We got rid of this. We removed entirely Xcode project files from our code base, from their repository, because we tapped into Xcode Gen tool that is available on GitHub. It's open source. And what it does is it creates Xcode project files based on the description. You just type into command line Xcode gen minus spec and provide a path to the specification of your project file. And the specification of a project file is a YAML manifest. YAML uh, is a sort of a dictionary. So in a text file, which is the specification, you put uh, specific settings for your project. You describe how the project, Xcode project file gets generated by Xcode gen. So we'll provide the name of a project, configurations available such as debug and release, and a set of targets that are available uh, in the project. In our case, in the example, there is the card target, which is of type framework. It's built for iOS platform. Uh, sources that get built uh, are available under path modules cart uh, slash cart. And there are some configuration files with settings per each configuration. And it has a few dependencies, frameworks that are needed by cart framework in order uh, so that it could get built. And after running the Xcode gen command, voila, we have a brand new Xcode uh, project. Okay, but let's focus on another topic. What if you wanted to enforce a common structure for every new module? So how can you achieve that? You can create a template uh, that gets extracted by a command line tool from a zip. We actually created a tool called module gen. And this tool unzips the template. It replaces the placeholder from file names and from uh, the contents of the file. In our case, the placeholder was project name in angled brackets. And after the replacement, uh, it integrated, it integrates every new module into the workspace and it links the new module as a dependency of the main application target. And we uh, built this tool uh, by using a library that was open sourced by Apple last year. It's called Swift Argument Parser. And this library is awesome because it allows you to write a command line tool with a very few lines of code. So, Let's try to write this command that would replace contents uh, of a file. Uh, it's just, it's, if we wanted to do so, we would just have to write a replace command that would uh, conform to parsable command protocol. Uh, every parsable command needs to have a configuration uh, and it can get some arguments. And arguments in Swift argument parser are added to the command with a property wrapper called argument. And we need file path for the file in which we want to do the replacement. Uh, we need a string that gets replaced, the placeholder that gets replaced. And we need a replacement string. So this is a string for which we want to replace the placeholder. And the heart of the command lies in the run function. And we can implement it with just three lines of code. We'll just read uh, the 
the, the file uh, into a string, we would replace the occurrences of the placeholder within the file with the replacement string. And then we would just write the whole string back to the file. And then 15 lines of code, we have just one piece of module GAN ready. If we wanted to use it on a project YML manifest coming from a template, we would just have to run the command as follows. Replace, let's supply the path to the manifest, which is project YML. Our placeholder would be project name in angled brackets. And then we want to uh, use the cart name for our module. And voila, there we have. In every uh, workspace, in every project, we can have multiple uh, tools used in order to achieve certain uh, things or solve certain problems. Uh, in our case, we had module gem that generated new fancy modules. Uh, we had Xcode gem that generated, uh, based on the specification, our Xcode project files. And we would also have the fix me shell script that would fix common problems. And we would have a bunch of others uh, of other scripts as well, or tools. So it's a lot of things to remember, especially for uh, newcomers to the uh, project. So we created a new tool based on Swift argument parser that would wrap uh, all those commands into a commonly known interface. And we called it Steve. So Steve helps us to generate new fancy features, to generate Xcode project files, or to fix uh, problems with the workspace. And what's awesome with Swift argument parser is that by tapping into command configuration that I mentioned a few slides back, uh, for every command, we would get uh, a noise description of every uh, subcommand in a tool. And I told you that we had fix me and generate commands for Steve. Uh, we also have Bazel and focus and test commands available, but I will briefly talk about them uh, in the future, in a moment. So, uh, when we wanted to integrate Bazel, we needed to unify the structure of subproject and we tapped into Xcode gen to generate project files. We didn't solve the problem of single language code base. We still have Swift and Objective-C in our code base. Uh, we created build files for uh, Bazel so that it knows how to build our uh, our frameworks, and we used Bazel build command instead of Xcode build to uh, build uh, our modules for the main application. So the uh, easiest way to describe how your project gets built is to create those build files. And in every build file, usually at the top of it, there's a load statement. And it loads Bazel rule. And Bazel rule is the actual implementation on how to build the, uh, the piece of software. We created this in-house rule called Allegro Xcode build module. And it contains module function. And you can see invocation of it uh, in the slide. So we tell Bazel that we have this module named cart and it has, it has a set of dependencies such as analytics, commons, module kit and networking. And Bazel knows that if it wanted to uh, build cart, it would have to build those dependencies first. And what's awesome with build files and having such description is that if you had all the modules described by build files, you could use Bazel to query uh, for dependencies of a certain module of or what depends on a certain module. By tapping into Bazel query uh, dependencies of cart, uh, we would get the following output. Uh, from the build file, it says that uh, we need to, uh, that the cart depends on analytics, 
on the source files of the cart module itself on the commons module kit networking. It also tells us that uh, our module depends on common configuration files for each project and on the Bazel binary that builds uh, the whole thing. And we also can ask Bazel, we can query for RDEPs, which is basically uh, asking for what, uh, what modules depend on another module. In the example, what modules depend on networking. And we can also, for oh yeah, for Bazel query, we can also use different outputs. Uh, in the example, we will use uh, output graph, which can be streamed out to another file. And by using the dot tool, we can create an image representation of the graph. And we can learn that actually a lot of stuff depends on networking in our workspace. So Bazel build file uh, usually loads another rule at the very top uh, statement in the file. And in our case, the Bazel rule that we load is 200 lines long. So I'm just showing you a brief snippet of the file. Uh, and every rule is written in the Starlark language. It's like a Python based language, but it has less features. And it's also based on the, uh, on the functions or, and variables. It has uh, all things like that. So our uh, module function has also some uh, default parameters so that in the build file, we only have to supply uh, the function with the name of the module and its dependencies. All the rest gets filled up automatically. And this module function uses the uh, underscore framework function. And this function gets a lot more parameters. And thanks to the unification of the uh, structure of every module, we were able to prefill it uh, in this rule file so that we have sources that get some globe patterns uh, as a parameter. We have some configuration to be selected, such as debug or release. These are the two that we built our application for and every framework. And it also can uh, take an SDK as a parameter, such as uh, iPhone simulator or iPhone device. And in the very heart of the implementation of the, of the framework function, uh, we get the context. And context is a, a thing on which you can call actions. It's a self-concatenated environment uh, on which you can run actions. And in our case, we would, run, we would use executable to uh, run action on it. So every Bazel rule gets a set of inputs. In our case, these would be source files of the module to be built. It also uh, specifies outputs that get produced upon running an action on inputs. And uh, based on these two, Bazel knows whether it should rebuild a module if there if something in the inputs changed or supply them from cache. Uh, we use executable uh, to run the action and we actually use Steve. So Steve has this uh, hidden command and it's invoked through arguments. The command is called framework and under the hood, it uses Xcode build and Xcode build gets project path and scheme and SDK uh, to build artifact, our module. And this artifact is copied by Steve to the output directory so that Basil, Basil could cache this framework. So Steve once again helped us a lot while building Basil. And by default, our Xcode workspace is super narrow. It contains only three projects. There's the main Allegro application project. There is a project for UI tests and the Bazel dependencies project. 
And this Bazel dependencies project contains a run script that invokes Bazel to build the dependencies. All the frameworks that uh, build up our main Allegro binary. So what the script does in the Bazel dependencies project is it reads the frameworks from a text file and it invokes Steve. Remember, Steve has this Bazel command and it is able to pass a call to Bazel in order to build all the frameworks from the list. It also provides configuration for which the whole workspace gets built and an SDK for which it gets built as well. And Steve uh, builds the frameworks, Steve invokes Bazel, and in return, Bazel calls under the hood Steve to use Xcode build to build the uh, project and to copy the framework into uh, a location, desired location. We can also focus on modules in our workspace. And when we want to focus on the card module by using Steve, what Steve does is it adds the card project to the workspace and it also adds every other module that depends on the card module so that when everything gets built with changes to the card module, uh, all the issues can get noticed easily. By adding focusing on workspaces, uh, on projects into the workspace, uh, we save some time for developers whenever they open Xcode. And if they had to open 78 projects instead of three, uh, it would take a lot of time. We have also uh, continuous integration plans that fill up our cache for every pull request and every change to a pull request. And of course, for the main development branch. And we have two jobs for a plan on the continuous integration. One of them builds uh, frameworks for iOS simulator and the other job builds it for a uh, device, builds them for iOS device. And actually Bazel can cache any output because it executes some actions on inputs. So uh, we can actually write a module test rule that would invoke uh, unit tests. Uh, again, we would use under the hood Steve to invoke Xcode build to uh, run tests. And we would copy uh, log files of a test and we would cache them. And if nothing changes in the uh, module for which tests were run, uh, it supplies uh, test results from cache. So by running Bazel tests in the command line and supplying the target, which is cart test, in our case, we would uh, either run unit tests for cart or get results from cache. And it's also a nice alternative to fast lane. There were some gotchas though, uh, when it comes to integration of the Bazel. Uh, I showed you on the graph at the beginning of the presentation that we had some peak, uh, peaks uh, when it comes to build times. And they were because our cache would uh, get invalidated before our measurement plan got run. And cache can get invalidated because of a few reasons. So for example, Xcode can add some can change files such as storyboards, zip files, or Xcode project files uh, just upon opening them. So it's good to uh, skip changes in some of these files if you can. You should also exclude DS store files, otherwise it could invalidate cache as well because system changes uh, contents of these files. Uh, what was peculiar for us was that uh, actually single language code base wasn't needed. We are able to uh, create Bazel rule that uses our own tooling to create binaries that can get cached. And uh, what's uh, gotcha for us is also that if there is nothing in the cache for some reason and our developers use Bazel, uh, the progress bar in Xcode would freeze for as long as Bazel needs to rebuild all the frameworks. 
So uh, I lied a bit because we didn't get from 307 seconds to 88, but to 57 seconds. And it happened in January this year, January 2021. Uh, we were able to achieve 57 seconds and to this time constitute time of building the main Allegro test target to build net notification extension target and downloading uh, cache and linking everything all together. But it was a main uh, step for us and it was possible because we extracted the legacy code base from the main application target into the core framework. We also noticed that having uh, many small modules enables faster builds. So in one year, we were able to uh, go from 32 modules to 78 modules, and it's thanks to module gen. We also used Xcode gen for generating Xcode project files. I strongly encourage you to do the same in order to uh, get rid of different Xcode project files during code review. And thanks to Steve, we enabled a lot of jobs and we got them done. My name is Maciej Piotrowski, and you can reach me on Twitter under Pati00 handle. I work for Allegro. Allegro has a technical blog called Allegro Tech, and you can read about speeding up iOS builds with Bazel, a blog post which was written by my friend Kamil Pitch. I also wrote a blog post about speeding up uh, worm builds in Xcode. I would like to uh, say thank you to iOS Mobile core team at Allegro. Without you, this presentation wouldn't be possible. So thank you for your input. Have a great rest of the iOS Conf SD conference and uh, have fun, be good, be safe. Bye-bye.